what happens with unprocessed emotions. There's, where we're up to at this period in history, it's a bit of a weird time, I'm sure you'd agree. Um, there's more and more evidence piling up that we're living inside of a simulation. I hate that, that's so awkward. Uh, there's more and more evidence piling up that we're gonna be merging with artificial intelligence at an accelerated rate, more than we already are. I'm already merged with my smartphone, I don't know about you, but I'm spending way too much time looking at stuff. And I'm sure that that is impacting the quality of my consciousness. Uh, and I've, I've noticed that over the last couple of days, like I have a book and I'm like supposed to be reading a book, which is in real life. And then I'm just like, but before I read the book, I'm just gonna go and check this. And afterwards I'm like, what the hell did I do that for? That's really creepy. That's like, that's like, I've been an addict in my life. I'm like, this is just like an addiction. Some little voice in the brain goes, yeah, absolutely. We should totally do that thing that you said you were gonna do. But before you do, why don't you just look on your Instagram feed? I'm like, what a great idea. It would only take two or three seconds and it just, it's so good at what it's designed for. It's a tool of distraction. It's so, Facebook, the algorithms on Facebook and, and, and Instagram, they're watching you, they're watching me, they're learning. They're like, what does this guy look at? What's he gonna, um, I know because the YouTube people, I was communicating with them recently, uh, they wanted to help me to grow the channel and they're all about, which is fine, you know, it's not in and of itself an evil thing, but they're all about how do we keep people's eyes on your videos for longer? And I'm like, well, there's loads of things I could be doing to do that, but I don't, I don't want to do that kind of trickery, you know, hijacking people's consciousness. I don't know if you guys are watching uh, American Gods, uh, but there's a line, um, it's not in the book, but it's in the, it's in the TV show uh, where Medea, the goddess of the media, um, comes on the TV and says, uh, I'm here to receive worship. The TV is here to receive worship, uh, but not in the form of lamb's blood, in the form of time and attention. Um, and I didn't get any credit on that at all. So, hey, scriptwriter for American Gods, you know, you owe me a freaking cookie, one of those high protein cookies. Um, but it is, it's an important thing to consider, you know, what we're giving our time and attention to. That's why I started saying that at the end of the videos, because I don't know, like during a walk or like a meditation session or something, I was like, holy shit, I'm taking people's time and I'm taking their attention. And that's a really precious thing. That's a really high commodity, sorry, a high value commodity, hugely high value commodities. And I, I implore you to consider what you're giving your time and attention to. Um, here's me, you know, I, I, I suffer from the same thing. It slips in because it's in my pocket and I need it because you know, I need to use, I'm in foreign countries a lot, I need to use the maps to get there, I need to be able to keep on top of my emails, I need, and then I just find myself just slipping into looking through arguments about politics. It's via, so I go to Facebook to see what family and friends are doing, and then I, it throws me something up in the feed, and then I'm reading through the comments, and I'm just sat there going, what is wrong with humanity? And after 10 minutes of that, I'm like, what am I doing? What am I giving my time and my attention to? Which God am I feeding? Which, which god or goddess is currently sucking my energy out uh, without my consent and without even my knowledge. And you know, you need to, we need to be very, very much aware of that. The element of unprocessed emotion comes in when you say, well, what, what ultimate purpose does this serve? I'm not necessarily convinced that there's an overarching dark agenda, like one big dark agenda. I do think a lot of the bad things that people do we kind of do it to ourselves, not consciously, not deliberately. But these tools of distraction are taking you, taking me, taking us out of our body, out of the present moment, out of reality and into another reality. I'm just going to do another little digression, just one tiny little digression, just something for you to think about. Slavoj Žižek uh, wrote a paper and then did a lecture called The Reality of the Virtual. And when I first saw that, I was like, that's so childish. He's just doing up is down and also when there is an in, there is an out. He's being the sphinx. I mean, the reality of the virtual, you've just taken virtual reality and turned it on its head. Hmm. I looked at it again. One of the things that is happening is that there is now a new reality that we're being created. I, I claim um, the internet used to be about reality. It was a reflection of reality. It was the shadow on the wall. Reality was the thing, the sun would hit it, and the shadow on the wall was the internet. 
And now what we're seeing is there is a reality to the virtual. The internet is no longer, is less and less about reality and more and more about itself. And the more it becomes, the more the internet becomes self-referential, the more a whole new dimension is growing. Now you might think at this point that I've read too much William Gibson, too much uh, William Burroughs, and listened to too many Terence McKenna videos, and maybe took too much acid when I was a teenager. But stay with me. When I'm saying the word reality here, I mean obviously it's in a, it's in a metaphorical sense, but it does have power, a real power. Why? because of the emotions. So whether you're looking at the internet or you're considering like a postmodern deconstruction uh, of religion that is offered in the book, American Gods and in the series, what we give our time and our attention and our belief to grows in power, particularly what we give emotion to. What we are giving emotion to, now can we say that the internet doesn't become a dumping ground for emotions? in some places and in certain senses, often the negative emotions kind of get dumped and pushed out there. I remember reading an article about four years ago now that said it was like the Nietzsche quote, uh, um, when you look into the abyss, the abyss also looks into you and looking into the internet can actually draw out dark elements from you. So this reality that is the virtual reality isn't particularly uplifting. It doesn't bring out the best in people. It's not uh, uh, creating something that is particularly pleasant. So if we, and it actually is taking people from their real self, their real reality, their emotions, for example. The internet is kind of a drug. Uh, if it was a drug, I think it would probably be an opiate with psychedelic qualities. I think it would be like smoking opium or, or injecting heroin, but with a little bit of a, a psychedelic twist. The internet becomes its own reality tunnel. It's a journey. I, I explored myself. I was like, I've been staring into my phone and actually 15 minutes has now gone by. How do I feel? I feel doped out. I actually feel, I feel pretty good. I feel, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. I'm not, you know, I'm vaguely agitated over the stupid things people are saying. And, you know, the, the, the same thing that every internet user feels when they're going, reading through the comment sections. How is humanity so stupid? So I'm getting my fix of um, egoic outrage for the, the dreadful state that humanity is in. But I know very well, and I've proven multiple times in my own life, that that thought pattern and the emotion that is guiding it creates reality. So not only is the internet, which I've stuck over here for some reason for this video, but let's say it's here, building its own uh, inertia you know, the American president is in trouble because of a, a, a gif that he put on the internet. I'm not getting into politics on this video. I've been a very vocal uh, critic of Donald Trump, but that is something that is, uh, was clearly intended as a joke. It was spurious. This lack of, uh, but I'm not defending him because that's appropriate if he sends it to his mate or to a group of mates. It's like he doesn't know what his role is. It's like he hasn't realized what his role is and he has no boundaries. And that's the other thing that the internet does is it erodes boundaries, but not in the positive way where Terence McKenna would talk about one of the side effects of uh, the, the, the uh, psychedelics and the way in which we used to live as humans. And when I say used to live, I'm talking more than 30,000 years ago, where we were tribal beings that traveled together there would be fewer boundaries. There wouldn't be this individualistic boundary, me and mine, it would be ours. Things would be ours, problems would be ours, rewards would be ours. Everything would be more uh, shared and there was less boundaries and that psychedelics can take us back to that place was one of the things that Terence McKenna suggested. It breaks boundaries in a way that is positive. I'll do my Terence McKenna impression. It even breaks boundaries between you and your washing machine. This is not that. This kind of boundary breaking is the boundary breaking that doesn't connect me to you. It actually separates me from you because it's, there are external boundaries and there are internal boundaries. It breaks down external boundaries to the point where presidents of, you know, of, like, why, why stick with Trump? I mean, there are presidents out there 
who have deliberately been photographed riding topless on the back of a horse by a professional and then distributed that, that photograph. At that point, I start to say, do you, do you know what it is that you're supposed to be doing right now, mate? You've got a pretty important job. I don't need to see your middle-aged man titties, thank you. I just wanna know that you're, you're guiding the ship that is this huge country that is potentially very, very powerful. I just, just do that. But there's a lack of boundaries now. There's a lack of, and this is something that Slavoj Žižek said years ago, there's a lack of boundaries now between the public space and the private space. And that more and more people will use a, 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 a public space as though it is private. Because we just have become, the internet is training us to feel entitled to everything and everyone. Access to everything and everyone. On any given week, I will have uh, more than three or four emails from people who are furious with me that I will not simply give them my time and my attention for free. And I try explaining to them, I'm like, this is, this is my role, this is my job, this is my profession. I don't think you'd ask your dentist to work for free. I don't think you'd ask a solicitor to work for free. I don't really know why. <laughs> but then again, I also know it's because I'm here, it's because I'm on the internet, which means I'm in your pocket. I'm in your sweaty pocket. I'm in your sweaty smartphone pocket. And I'm just this little tiny face and I'm kind of like an app. So me as a living, breathing human being with a national insurance number and socks and a bank account and a list of jobs to do. And if I go to the supermarket and I forget to buy washing up liquid, I'm annoyed. Humans, like a human thing, I'm not, I'm now reduced to that, uh, to an app in some sense. And then in another sense, I'm blown up to something else. And I think people's uh, grasp of reality is slipping, is actually getting worse. So the inner boundaries would be what is a thought, what is a feeling, and what is my self image versus what is my beliefs. And that all just gets <laughs> thoughts, feeling, self image, belief, desire. Yeah. I want it, I must have it. No impulse control, no self-discipline. External boundaries would be, you know, that's your problem, not my problem. So your problems are now becoming my problems and, my, and I'm open to that. So what you will have, uh, if we keep down the road we're on now, is a blurring where people will become more and more narcissistic and more and more predatory, and at the same time, they will become more and more what we have been calling codependent. They will be more and more open to, to abuse because the internet also makes people incredibly impressionable. That's why we're having this ludicrous, and it is ludicrous, argument about fake news. I mean, what does that mean? What has that ever meant? Fake news. It's the it's the it's got to be the oxymoron of, of, of 2016. As though over here there is the news which is the real, and nobody ever put a spin upon it. No news agency ever had an agenda or ever had a political leaning one way or the other, versus this other stuff. Boys and girls, come on now, what are we twelve? Like, you know, it, it's it's, it's a, it's a full-on boundary-breaking uh, uh, crash that we're facing where a president and a, a meth head in a trailer in Arizona can argue on Twitter within seconds. You know, that's not a good thing. Uh, um, Joe Rogan, I watched one of Joe Rogan's shows and he was quoting somebody else. I'm sorry, I can't remember the guy he was quoting, but he quoted him as saying, the great thing about the internet is it puts you together and connects you with people that you would otherwise never be connected with. And the terrible thing about the internet is it puts you together with people that you would otherwise never be connected with. So all of the boundaries are breaking. So people are gonna become more narcissistic and they're gonna become more vulnerable because the internet makes people incredibly uh, uh, naive and impressionable. You know, you, people release a clickbait story that has the words clickbait written all over it. Like what this headline is, and what this graphic picture shows you almost certainly never occurred this way in reality. Read on. And then people don't even, they don't even read it. They don't even read the thing. They just, they want to spew an opinion straight away. This is not good. This is the opposite of the, uh, you know, objectivism, the scientific method, trying to follow certain protocols of philosophical debate, avoiding logical fallacies. You know, all of this is, is actually 
pandering to the worst elements of human nature and it will make us uh, less intelligent and uh, uh, more um, more impulsive, more easy to control and that worries me. The emotional literacy that we need might help with this. Unprocessed emotion over time stops being the emotion that it started out being. So if you feel a massive amount of shame or a massive amount of fear or a massive amount of anger, repress and deny, repress and deny, repress and deny, weeks, months, years, it then becomes part of your personality, it then just becomes part of the system. Like as soon as that emotion comes up, you shove it down to one side, you might project it onto somebody else or into another thing or the wrong political party or the wrong political person or blah, outward, but it's still there. And as you repress it, let's say shame for example. When I say to people, uh, narcissistic personality disorder is a shame-based personality disorder, they go, no it's not. My narcissist wasn't ashamed of anything. He, he or she was the most shameless person I've ever known in the world. I'm like, no, 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 shame-based. Like, so shame from childhood, huge shame, repressed and unexpressed over time, ossifies, calcifies, rots, changes. It now becomes a gunk. It now becomes a mutated version of what shame is. Like if I'm walking down the street and my flip-flop falls off and I trip, and uh, uh, I, I do it and then I feel like, oh, I feel silly now. And then I get like my blood rushes to my cheeks. And I'm like, oh, let's, I hope nobody saw that. Or, or I might like go, I meant to do that because now it's time for a little break dance. Ah, finish my break dance, now off I'll go. I'll try and blag it, but I'll do blag it with a red face and a sweaty forehead and people will be like, you're blagging it. That wasn't a genuine, authentic break dance moment right there. Like, come on guys, give me a break. That is not what we're talking about. When you have a little moment of shame, that's an authentic emotion, and then you have neurotic emotions. All of the repressed emotions become neurotic. What happens? If people keep repressing their true emotions and not expressing them, they can become very, 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 very sick. They can become emotionally infantile. They can become mentally very, very ill. They can get huge amounts of depression. They can get huge amounts of anxiety. Right now in the United Kingdom, uh, and I know elsewhere around the world, the levels of, de of re reported depression and anxiety are off the charts. And many times people are saying that they're depressed or saying that they're anxious because they don't have any other words to describe the shit show of what they're feeling or sometimes of what they're not feeling. Because for some people they just flatten out, they just go completely numb. All of this can be protected against. We can defend ourselves against all of this through becoming more emotionally literate through becoming more emotionally literate, meaning, in essence, you learn to literally, and I'm using the word literally, literally, to apply more words to an emotion. So instead of going, I'm fucking pissed off, you'd be able to say, I'm really disappointed, I'm frustrated, and I feel, uh, I feel ripped off. Okay, frustration, disappointment, ripped off. Let's look at frustration. Have you ever felt frustrated before? Is there any emotion that's behind the emotion of frustration? Yeah, uh, sadness. I'm really, really sad. So we started with, you're pissed off, and then we gave it more words. We just gave the emotion more words. And you might think, that's ridiculous. How's that gonna help anybody? Through doing that, and through acknowledging that and actually looking at the emotion and saying, hey, uh, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Emotion, you're a part of me. You're not an unwelcome guest who's not allowed past the castle gates, who's to be fobbed off and sent away to live, you know, uh, um, uh, outside and, and to die somewhere because they never do. They never go off and die. They just go underneath the castle and rot in the dungeons and then the stink comes up. You say, okay, I don't really want you here. I gotta be honest, like you're a messenger of something that is horrible and I'm feeling good, I'm having a party in my kingdom right here. We're having a feast. And you're coming here and you wanna to talk to me about depression and sadness and unprocessed grief from childhood. Oh man, you're such a downer. And they're like, oh, that's the message I have to deliver you. What do you want from me? I gotta tell you when things are bad. So you say, okay, come in. You let them in through the castle gates. You bring them in, you sit them down and you actually listen to them and you acknowledge what they're saying. And you break it down and you say, okay, well, where's the grief coming from? Where's the sadness coming from? Where's all this rage coming from? Why am I so frustrated? What's behind it? And give it words and expand it out and then actually turn around to that messenger, which is the emotion and say, okay, I hear you. You have said this, 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 and this. 
and I'm going to do something about what you've told me, Mr. Messenger or Mrs. Messenger. I'm gonna do this, this, and this. If you process it and you give that messenger action steps that you're gonna take that satisfies the, the messenger, which is emotions, it'll leave you alone. It'll go away. That persistent anxiety that's waking you up at two in the morning every night that means you can't sleep anymore, it will go away. But you must address the emotions. That means permitting the emotion. That means welcoming the emotion. That means acknowledging the emotion. I'm not pushing you away. I don't like to feel bad. I'm not crazy, I'm not a masochist. I don't like feeling bad. But when grief comes, when sadness comes, when rage comes, when frustration comes, when disappointment comes, if I push it away, it's gonna come back later and hurt me because it, it's like, I'm a messenger. You need to listen, listen to me, listen, listen, listen. This is important. It's trying to protect me. It's trying to move me towards pleasure and move me away from pain. So I have to listen. If you can do that, if you can let it in, and if you can be brave, because the emotions that you're pushing away are gonna be the ones that make you feel icky. If you can be brave, if you can witness the emotion and let it come, let it come like waves. That's the way I always think of it. It's like when you walk down the beach and it's silent and you're just listening to the sound of the waves and they come in and they go out and they go, they come in and they go out and they're doing that. And they've been doing that for millennia before we arrived, before we got here. That exact same sound, the waves coming in and coming out and they'll be there for millennia long after we're gone. It's infinite. The whole thing is infinite. Our perception of time is actually locking us into part of the problems that we're facing at the moment. It's infinite and it's now. It's always now, it's always in this moment. Bad emotion comes in, you let it flow in. You keep breathing, you hold it, you just let it be inside of the body and you release. You breathe out, you breathe in, you breathe out. And anybody who's been through a grieving cycle will tell you it comes in waves. It's never just like one, big thing, it comes in waves, it comes and it goes, it comes and it goes, and you have to trust the process. You have to let yourself feel those emotions, acknowledge them, understand what they are, and then you can let go of them. And your consciousness clarifies when you do. You cease to be clouded by old fart clouds of negative, horrible, shitty emotions that are clouding everything and that make you moody and impatient and addicted and needy and impulsive. So just being like, oh, whew, okay, this space is a clear space. Oh, I can sit on my own and not feel anxious. I can sit on my own and not feel depressed. I can sit on my own and not feel much of anything at all other than the presence of being here in the moment and just being quite happy to just be alive. But it takes some bravery. You have to sit, you have to witness, you have to permit, and you must be brave. It's important to be very, very brave. Okay, thank you for your time and your attention. I hope that was useful and uh, I look forward to speaking to you soon. Cheers.